everyone. How's it going here? A um, little bit of a setup or a different setup for my video lessons usually. Uh, normally, whenever it's like a literary analysis thing, I'm at home or something like that. And I thought this time, because we're actually going through a lesson, that you'd actually be in the room or at least looking at it like we normally do. And now instead, I'm just talking at a camera real close like. That was probably really out of focus and I apologize, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna go through, we're gonna do a couple of these this week. I promise you, promise you, I'm gonna upload them at home, them at home from now on, all right? No more of these like seven, seven hours, hours to upload a video <laughs> because of the school internet. I'm not messing with that anymore, okay? Everything's done at home from now on, promise you, all right? So, what we're gonna go over today is a quick review of figurative language um, because I know you guys have covered it in previous years, you've seen it plenty of times, uh, but now we're starting to look at figurative language usage, not just in terms of identification, but why it's used, what kind of effect it has, and how we can start implementing it in our own sort of styles as well, especially if you guys, as you're working on your short stories, having a good grasp of uh, figurative language and how to use it is gonna be huge for you guys, okay? Figurative language is also one of those things that helps us with uh, uh, analysis too, because figurative language technically counts under uh, literary devices, so some kind of things that are utilized to augment or make your writing better, or at least what authors do. All right, so let's look at these. This is gonna be information that's review for you guys, like I said, but it's good to go over it so that we kind of have an understanding of how it gets used. So first off, authors are gonna use figurative language to provide some kind of emphasis on uh, scenes or situations to uh, explain some difficult concepts. I like to think of figurative language as being used to kind of bridge a gap. Right? It may be easy for us to describe something, and oftentimes it's actually easier for us to describe something by comparing it to something else or providing some kind of emphasis. Right? Think about any time that you've tried to describe a situation. You've probably used some kind of simile to do that. Okay, That's going to make it really easy, especially if it's a foreign concept. It's like trying to explain something that's happening in space or to something that no one has really a memory or experience to base it off of. Figurative language bridges that gap for us. When you pair it with tone, mood, and imagery, uh, figurative language really helps to create a very vivid tapestry, some kind of thing for us to be able to visualize uh, and understand and empathize with much more uh, much easier so that we can communicate some complex messages. So for you guys, you have some stories that are going to be really elaborate and you're trying to communicate really unique ideas, using figurative language is going to help with that, especially when you pair it with tone, mood, and imagery. So one of the major ones that we have as far as a form of figurative language is going to be a metaphor. All right, metaphor is going to be something that uh, is basically explicitly stating that one thing is another thing in a literal sense, right? Especially if it's two unlike things, okay? So having something that is this, having something that is very unique and different and saying explicitly that they are together, right? By making these connections, what we're able to do is create a really firm association between them. All right, by saying that this is this, it gives it a much more concrete sense and it enables us to kind of imagine that situation or visualize that forward thing in a much more concrete manner. So for example, bear in mind that death is a drum, right? We see this metaphor here, death, being compared to a drum. These are two very unlike things, right? And we have to, it kind of forces us to think a little bit about what that means, right? Drum is something that we hit continuously and rhythmically, right? So is drum, uh, is death something that is rhythmic and continuous and is unavoidable? I guess possibly, right? Um, do we constantly beat back to death like we would when we beat a drum? Oh, possibly, right? There's a lot of things that we can branch that off of, but by just making that connection here, it's giving us something that is very abstract, something that is much more concrete to us, and it gives a visualization that's a bit better. We can do that a little lightly, like maybe not as strong, by instead using a simile. So with a simile, we're still making a comparison between two things that are not similar, but instead of making it explicit, saying it is this, we're saying it is like this, or as this, or similar to, or than, some kind of word that brings that connection together, right? By doing that, we're able to further drive home that kind of visualization of the idea. Like I said, when you guys are describing something to someone, Really think about it. How often do you use a simile to describe it? Probably really similar, like probably often, right? Because it's easier to say, okay, you can't visualize this thing that I'm talking about, but you can probably visualize this. And they're not the same, so it's like this. And it's a lot easier to communicate that idea because it's putting 
a similar picture in their mind and allowing the reader or allowing the person you're talking to to draw that connection. Um, I'll put the, these slides up on the team's general channel for you guys so you can review through them. You can also feel free to pause the video at points if you're trying to get this information down. But I'm going to try to go at a pretty quick pace for you guys on that. So for like this, to choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. So this should look pretty familiar to you guys. It's from last week's Life of Pi reading, right? Uh, is akin to like to choose doubt as a philosophy. That's not quite a simile here, but saying that immobility, like trying to compare doubt as a philosophy to immobility as a means of transportation, right? By saying that to live in doubt and having that as like your method of living through life, it's basically saying that I'm going to move through the world. I'm going to choose to not move as a means of movement, right? He's comparing these two sort of ideals to one another. So we may not really think of like choosing doubt as a philosophy of life. That doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal, but as far as he's concerned, it's similar to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. I know I'm gonna get to school by not going anywhere. Don't see how that really works out, right? And that's kind of the message that Pi is trying to get across when he's uh, speaking down about agnostics. Another one of our important figurative language types is going to be hyperbole, not hyperbole, hyperbole, right? Think of hyperbole as an exaggeration, right? Something to emphasize a point, something that is bigger, more extravagant, and, and really beyond, okay? Think of hyperbole as being really massive. Usually by doing this, you're drawing attention, right? You're drawing attention to uh, specifically the difference between the extreme and the normal, right? So if the extreme is massive in the way that they're trying to communicate that, where that hyperbole is going to is, okay, so maybe it's not that extreme, but obviously this is a large deal, or it's a big deal, right? And it might also be used by a character in a particular way because of characterization. They may make a big deal or over-exaggerate a lot of things. So we can say that, oh, they utilize hyperbole a lot, and to us, that's something that we can learn about character. For example, are we going to write like 30,000 poems again? <laughs> this is from a student last year who uh, after their seventh grade poetry assignment, where I did not make them write 30,000, it was more like a handful of haikus, a free form, a like it was maybe less than 10 poems total. And that includes haikus, and haikus are not that bad, right? But he was he was very upset with me about having to write those. So last year, sorry, last year he asked, are we gonna write 30,000 poems again? Um, so this is definitely an example of hyperbole. Here, he's trying to emphasize that in his opinion, they wrote a lot of poems, and so we can see that exaggeration here as drawing attention to it, saying, we wrote a lot of poems last time, or we have to do that again. So he's giving us that emphasis there. The last one that's gonna be important is gonna be personification. Personification is gonna be a figure of speech that gives human qualities to inanimate objects, right? It's not the same as the anthropomorphication, right? That's Pi's father talking about how Animals are kind of like fulfilling this position of being like humans, right? I would say that more often than not, Pi is talking about personifying those animals by giving them human qualities, voices, personalities, characteristics, and things like that. It gives our author an opportunity to give a very foreign thing, a very human-like emotion and feeling. So us as readers can have a bit more connection with it. We're more likely to connect with something that has similar attributes to us in terms of its thoughts and its feelings and how it motivates and what it moves it. And by using that personification, it really drives that point home. I'll show you guys an example here. So for example, it is the mind, the mind that must be cured short of death's intervention. So here, talking about the mind being cured, not quite the personification, uh, but death's intervention, now we're talking, because here we're talking about death intervening in some way, right? Having some kind of motivation or something that it's actively doing. How's it hanging, death? So we, by curing the mind, are, stuck, like, are, are, are getting to that point, right? And saying like, okay, death, you are trying to do something, you have an impact here, we are stopping that. So it's an active sort of thing. And by having that personification, it gives more movement, it gives more, like I said, motivation, whatever is going on, and it helps us uh, visualize it a bit better. It's one thing to say that like dandelions lines were moving in the wind, that's great. But dancing in the wind, that gives us a bit more of a uh, flair to what it is that's being described. So we we'll look at this one. There's no world without Verona walls, but purgatory, torture, hell itself. You look at this, 
And if we're saying that there's a figurative language in here, we're not really comparing anything in particular. We don't have much in the way of personification, like the walls aren't being personified really. But what we are saying is outside of Verona, outside of that area, all you see is purgatory, torture, and hell itself. Now, I've never been to Verona, and I've never seen outside Verona's walls, but I have a feeling it's not quite this bad. So thank you for that clever bit of hyperbole in this particular example. The clouds were low and hairy in the skies, like glass blown floor in the gleam of eyes. Ah, so, again, some more uh, figurative language in here. We're low and hairy in the skies, like locks blown forward in the gleam of eyes. Our first instinct is to think maybe personification, right? Low and hairy. I don't think anything's necessarily getting human characteristics. However, we are going to say that the clouds, the way that they kind of sit in the sky, the way that they hang there, are like locks blown forward in the gleam of eyes. So like the hair that blows in front of us, how low those bangs maybe fall forward. So very much a simile in this particular example. The pines at the base of Mount Blanc are children of elder time. So we're talking about pines, right, trees at the base of a mountain, right? But we're also saying that they are like children of elder time. So this R right here, boom, very specific, very explicitly stating that the pines are these things, children of elder time. You've got a metaphor. So we look at this one. The sky, lazily disdaining to pursue the setting sun, too indolent to hold a lengthened tournament for flashing gold, passively darkens for night's barbecue. So here we actually have mostly the sky being talked about here. We don't have anything really comparing per, per se. We're saying that the sky is lazily disdaining to pursue the setting sun. Why is it pursuing the setting sun like the sky is going after it? Lazily? Saying that it's indolent to hold a lengthy tournament for flashing gold and how it's passively darkening? Very much characterization, or personification rather, of sky here, characterization, what I'm talking about. But definitely personifying sky here by saying that it's lazy and that it's not pursuing the setting sun, it's very passive in what it's doing. Something like this, one must have the mind of winter. Here, we're comparing mind to winter and saying that that's one, what, what one must have. So, by comparing these two things, we're not using like or as, we're actually saying that it's very similar. Um, I would say that this is an example of the metaphor here. And then we have this, she is as in a field as, uh, she is as in a field, so content. At midday when a sunny summer breeze has dried the dew and all its ropes, ropes were lent, so that in guys it gently sways and ease. So we have this really long comparison between where she is and saying, as in a field of silk, and, a field of silk in tent at midday when the sunny summer breeze has dried the dew. But then we also have the sunny summer breeze has dried the dew. I don't know if that's actively drying it, right? We can say that that's a very passive thing, and not necessarily be personification. And all its ropes were lent. Um, that's interesting, the ropes were lenting. Talking about the silk in tent. So the ropes were lenting is kind of like, um, almost giving it a personification a little bit. But we definitely have that as here, which is giving us simile. My choice is kind of one of those last rhetorical sort of things that I want to get into. It's basically a form of understatement, so the opposite of hyperbole, but what we're using is like double negatives in place of an obvious positive. So it forces us to think a little bit about what's being stated because we have this like one negative plus another negative and making it a positive. Usually it's deliberate to use a light tone. Uh, but the goal here is to provide a certain emphasis on what's being described. It's very easy to just say, oh, it's this, right? Describing something in a positive way. By changing it up, though, and using a light tone, gives it more emphasis. Like, my table partner is not unattractive. So when we have this, we have unattractive, which is a negative. But then we have not, which is also a negative. So by saying not unattractive, what we're actually saying is that my table partner is handsome or attractive, right? So the meaning of the light tote is the confirmation. We could have just said my table partner is handsome, but that's here by saying my table partner is not unattractive. It gives it a little bit more emphasis, right? It forces us to think a little bit, which therefore gives it, it makes pay a little bit more attention. Something like this. The food was not bad. Okay, the food was good. Or maybe even very good by saying the food was not bad. Or we have like that sword was not useless to the warrior now. So Beowulf saying, not useless, right? It's very useful at this point. Or, he was not unfamiliar with the works of Dickens, meaning 
He's obviously very familiar with it. You are not wrong, meaning you're correct. Or she is not as young as she was, meaning uh, she's probably pretty old, right? All of these examples of giving that confirmation by doing the double negative. And again, giving us that emphasis there. I think that's it for today. We'll get into tone, mood, and we'll get into imagery tomorrow. Um, once again, I appreciate you guys for being patient with the video that was uploaded today from my Pi. I didn't want to go too crazy with you guys. Make sure you knock out the figurative language practice uh, in the forms assignment. Not only are you identifying forms of figurative language, you're also giving an explanation of what kind of the purpose would be for that figurative language and also a little bit of your own writing as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys there. Uh, do there. Hopefully you guys like this kind of format, uh, at least for when um, I can't do a live lesson. Hopefully, like I said, we're going to be coming back in person as soon as you guys can actually see me physically. Uh, but having something like this, uh, I think is definitely better than having just some run-of-the-mill PowerPoint that you read along with or have some voiceover to. I think this is going to be uh, a little bit of a better experience, but you guys can be the judge there. Uh, anyways, that's all I have today. Thank you guys again for being patient. I appreciate all of you. And uh, we'll see you with another video tomorrow. Bye.